If you would like to support the channel, then please turn off adblock and refresh the page. Alternatively, use the link in the description below to donate to T1 Patreon. Thank you. Hello Magic Community on YouTube, I'm T1 Glistener Elf. When the designers of a trading card game are working on their first set, balance is hard to make work. <laughs> I think that that usually goes without saying, right? You don't have the background, you don't have the experience, you don't have the context of other cards to help you decide what is and isn't too powerful. And this is true in the case of, say, Magic the Gathering, but also Yu-Gi-Oh! In their first sets, they had extremely powerful cards. If you think about the Power Nine in Magic the Gathering, all of them came from Alpha. Well some of those cards, they do try to keep bringing back. Magic the Gathering hasn't really tried to bring the Moxin back, but they've worked on Black Lotus, they've worked on Ancestor Recall, they've worked on Time Twister, they've worked on Time Walk. And this could be for a number of reasons. For example, it's just the sentimentality of, let's have this throwback to a previous era in the game. It could also be that they like the effect but they realized that it was broken when it was first made, and so they want to try to fix it to give it the appropriate power level. Yu-Gi-Oh! does the same thing with a few cards. If you think about the cards that have been on the forbidden list since time immemorial, <laughs> a few come to mind. In Magic the Gathering, the one I'll be focusing on is Ancestral Recall. In Yu-Gi-Oh!, the one that I'll be focusing on is Pot of Greed. And actually, that's that's the throwback card. The newer card for each of these is really important, but I'll get to that in just a second. So Ancestral Recall, I'm going to start off with the magic example because I know that most people who watch my channel are magic aficionados. Ancestral Recall costs you one blue mana for an instant speed, draw three cards. That's it. No downside other than the one mana. That's really it, and susceptibility to dispel. <laughs> like, that matters. This is an unbelievably broken card, right? When you think about in Alpha, which one was the rare? Ancestral Recall. That should have been the point when they realized we're making all of the other ones in this cycle. Lightning Bolt, Giant Growth, Dark Ritual, Healing Salve, I think? We're making all of the rest of these commons, but we're gonna make this one a rare. It's probably your first red light. It's probably your first warning. And they printed it anyway, and lo and behold, it was exactly as powerful as you think it would be. Of course. Of course. There was a time when a deck called The Deck, it was so good that running off of extremely powerful enablers like Ancestral Recall and Black Lotus and the Moxin, what did it have as its win, as its win conditions? Sarah Angel. <laughs> Sarah frickin' Angel. Compare Sarah Angel to Archangel Avison, and you realize how underpowered that card was. But context is everything. At all of those control cards that made, not just control cards, but enablers, that set the environment for Sarah Angel meant that you could put it out and not really be opposed. <laughs> That's how ridiculous this this archetype was, and Ancestral Recall was a big part of it, but as a result, they, they tried to make Ancestral Recall work in a number of different ways. Uh, it's one mana, draw three cards. That's the baseline that they're working from. One mana, draw three cards. Now sometimes this effect, when they try to fix it, is too weak and it can't really see play. Shared Discovery being a prime example of that. Shared Discovery, Again, one mana, draw three cards, it's sorcery speed instead of instant, but as an additional cost you have to tap four creatures you control. It, that made it pretty much unplayable outside of limited, where well, my understanding from what I've heard is it was great and limited, but outside of that not so much. It's having four creatures is just too much of a cost. Maybe token stacks can run it, but even then, you're giving up your blockers, and you're not playing it on turn one. It's just not all that great. Sometimes they try to put a restriction like a, a time-based restriction on it. For example, there's Ancestral Vision. Yeah, you can play it on your first turn, 
but it has to spin four. You're not going to draw those three cards for some time. Now that does mean that when it comes off suspend, you're not paying mana for it, which might make counter wars a little bit easier. But outside of that, no, this is this is good enough for modern. It's powerful. It's extremely powerful in modern. It powerful enough that it used to be banned, preemptively banned. One of those cards they didn't even want to risk. And now they've brought it out and it hasn't broken the game, but no one denies that it's a powerful effect. But sometimes they have their mishaps. And I think the most prominent of those is Treasure Cruise. Now Treasure Cruise costs 8 mana, except it doesn't. <laughs> it actually only costs 1 mana. For blue and 7, but we have Delve, uh, draw 3 cards. And Delve is each card you exile from your graveyard while casting the spell pays for colorless. So it will never go below 1 mana, but this is not that hard to enable. In Standard, in Modern, in Legacy, in Vintage, this card wasn't banned in Standard, but it's banned in Modern and Legacy and it's restricted in Vintage, which is as far as it can go. That's how close this was to Ancestral Recall. It was too close, it was too powerful. The baseline effect was so powerful already that when we try to get this close to it, well, Icarus has flown too close to the sun. Now, it may be the case that Wizards of the Coast is trying to step back just a bit away from effects like these, but even with a card like Reverse Engineer, which is a spoiled card from Aether Revolt, it costs three and blue blue, Improvise, which is a Convoke for Artifacts. It's your artifacts can help cast the spell. Each artifact you tap while you're done, activating mana abilities pays for one and then draw three cards. Okay, you would think that that means that it can't get below blue-blue for its cost, right? Artifacts are colorless. But even in Standard, we have one blue artifact that sees a ton of play, and that's Torrential Gearhulk. And then, of course, if you go back to Shards of Alara block, you have plenty of colored artifacts. So if we just look at that, we might say, assuming that the decks that would play this are also playing Torrential Gearhulk, this could be a 2 mana, 1 mana, or 0 mana Ancestral Recall. So I think that it's something that they're still trying to make happen. They're just being really cautious with it nowadays, especially in the light of what happened with Treasure Cruise. Now, to all my Yu-Gi-Oh! viewers who are still watching through this, thank you. Here's the comparison. So in Yu-Gi-Oh! the card is Pot of Greed. Very simply, draw two cards. That's it. Nothing else. There is no cost. There's not even a mana cost to it. Now, it's a normal spell, which means it's played, in magic terms, at sorcery speed. You can play it only on your turn, barring some shenanigans from other cards. But there's no cost to the card. It replaces itself and then gives you another card. Why wouldn't you run a card like this? For comparison's sake, a card like Upstart Goblin, which is only legal to one in the game, replaces itself and only itself, and gives your opponent a thousand life points. Now, there are so many of these kinds of effects that there's sort of a, a sub-archetype in Yu-Gi-Oh! called Greed. Because they keep trying to make Pot of Greed and not break the card. Two varying degrees of success. So, again, the shared discovery of Yu-Gi-Oh! would be Chaos Greed, and there's a number that could qualify here, but I prefer Chaos Greed. It's too hard to set up. It's, you can only activate this card if four or more of your cards are currently removed from play, and there are no cards in your graveyard, and then you draw two cards. That's not always easy to do, at all. There's a lot of setup that's involved in getting that, and it rarely can come out on turn one. So, as a result, that's just too weak. Sometimes you have a time-based effect, like Shard of Greed is the ancestral vision of Yu-Gi-Oh! Right, each time you draw a card for your normal draw in your draw phase, so not whenever you draw, just for your normal draw, place a Greed counter on this card. You can send this card with two or more Greed counters to the graveyard to draw two cards. So, it's your ancestral vision. You're not drawing as many cards, but you're not having to wait as long. But it's more vulnerable. And in a format with Twin Twister, and Twister, and Mystical Space Typhoon running around everywhere, this is probably not the right time, but you get the idea. This is 
meant to be a fixed pot of greed by making you wait for it. Sometimes they come across an effect that's too broken though. Right now the card Pot of Avarice is forbidden in Yu-Gi-Oh! You can run zero copies, even though it's a fixed version. Target five monsters in your graveyard, shuffle all five into the deck, then draw two cards. That's too easy for too many decks to enable, to turn on. And so as a result, it ends up being banned. There are decks that do that so readily and actually will gain benefits from it. Pot of Avarice was too close to the sun once again. And I think that Yu-Gi-Oh! has made that mistake yet again. I think that Yu-Gi-Oh! has made a card that's too close to Pot of Greed and that will eventually end up limited or forbidden. Pro I think forbidden is probably what's going to happen at some point. Maybe not the next ban list, but at some point. So it's called Pot of Desires. This one looks an awful lot like Pot of Greed. The first one, the prerequisite, is banish 10 cards from the top of your deck face down. Okay, so in Yu-Gi-Oh! you have to have at least 40 cards in your deck. So this hits a quarter of your deck. Considering that you draw 6 cards, well you draw 5 and then 6 on your, uh, on your turn if you're on the draw, if you're not on the play. Y you know what I mean. You draw so many cards that if you get 3 of these off in a game, this will not be a long game. Now, it does say you may activate no more than once per turn. So in other words, if you Pot of Desires into Pot of Desires, that's sort of a blank card for the turn. You'll have to wait till next turn. That's not much of a cost. It's really not. Think of this as what happens when Ancestral Recall meets Spoils of the Vault. Uh, this is what happens when you have to banish cards from the top of your deck there is a bit of a cost to it, but not usually that much. You're drawing two cards, you don't get to see what you banish. Now, that being the case, there are some decks that have to be careful about it, like ABCs for instance. ABCs, if, they're, if any A or B or C, if all of the copies of A, B, or C hit the banish zone, hit, uh, if they're removed from play, GG. <laughs> I mean, you lose. And it's face down, so you won't know that you've lost yet. But you draw two cards. That's too good. Alright. So, it's easy to draw the comparison between cards like Pot of Avarice and Pot of Desires to Treasure Cruise. They're trying to make an old effect happen while being fixed, and it just comes too close. I'm When I play Yu-Gi-Oh!, I want to have three of these. <laughs> there's very little opportunity cost, yeah, to having more than one, sure, there's a bit, but very little. Running one into another, not so unlikely. And by the way, by, or not so likely, I mean, by the way, it don't, you don't just take my word for it. As of the time that I'm recording this, Pot of Desires is an over $70 card. Now, granted, that's from a hundred. <laughs> to be that's from over a hundred, but the card the set has been printed and printed and printed, so supply is increasing, so the price is decreasing. That being said, if you had, I mean, think of Tarmogoyf in Magic: The Gathering. There's a reason why that card is so freakishly expensive. It's because it's just the best at what it does. If you're looking for big, dumb, green beatdown creatures, it's hard to get better than Tarmogoyf. It's hard to get better than two mana for. A 6-7, often. Well, it's hard to get better than no cost, draw two cards. And that's kind of what this is. Yeah, you banish 10 cards. That matters so little of the time that really that's less important than you may play no more than one per turn. There's not even really any set. In the case of Pot of Avarice, there's setup that's required. You have to get five monsters in. And yeah, some decks can do that super easily. Absolutely. There's no setup required for Pot of Desires. At all. Alright. Well... <sighs> In the meantime, before it gets banned, I'm gonna try to play with this card. Uh, maybe not, just because I think it's so likely that I may not want to pull the trigger on buying three of them. But if that's the case, in the meantime, I'm going to be running decks that are worse than other decks just because it's not 
running Pot of Desires. I maybe could pull the middle ground and just have one. That does reduce, completely eliminate the opportunity cost of play only one per turn. Alright, thank you for <laughs> watching and listening, Magic Community. I will see you later. Bye-bye.